33 Celsius. Venus has a much more dense atmosphere. Its atmosphere is 100 times as dense as the Earth's atmosphere, and the, the effect is 503 Celsius. Okay, I call this the greenhouse because the atmosphere is acting as a greenhouse. We're all familiar with, uh, you go on a, on a cold winter's day, it's frigid cold outside, you go into a greenhouse and it's warm. Why is it warm? There's no furnace inside. It's the, it's the fact that the glass allows uh, visual light to go through, but absorbs infrared light. And that's what our, our atmosphere does. So this is the greenhouse effect. It's not significant for Mars, significant for Earth, significant for Venus. So the important point here is that atmosphere is an important factor in the climate. And if atmosphere is an important factor, then changing the atmosphere in any way is going to have a major impact on climate. And the whole debate, the so-called climate wars, is about the effect uh, of various man-made uh, disturbances on our atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> where am I? Uh, so, um, now you want to include the atmosphere. Somehow or other, you have to include the atmosphere. Now the calculations get much more complicated than I've just shown you. The simplest calculation would be a one-dimensional calculation. Basically, you have the, the, uh, the energy from the sun incident upon the atmosphere, some of it coming through the atmosphere to, to the earth, some of it being reflected. Uh, well, you can read all that sort of stuff. I don't, don't want to go through it. Uh, that's a very simple model, and you get an answer which is an improvement over the previous answer. So you are including... The atmosphere has two effects. One, it reflects some of the light from the sun, so that light never gets to the Earth. Two, the Earth, the, the, the radiation that gets to the Earth is re-radiated from the Earth, and in the process of re-radiation has to pass back through the atmosphere again. Now here's where things become difficult. As it passes through the atmosphere again, some of it is again absorbed by the atmosphere and re-radiated back to the Earth. So you have this and then this sort of stuff. And you can see that can repeat itself over and over. It's an infinite series which you have to sum. And of course, this one-dimensional model doesn't include the fact that different areas of the Earth are warm differently. The equator gets a lot more energy from the sun than the North Pole. And so you go to more complicated models. Oh, by the way, <coughs> this first model you can still do with pencil and paper. After that, give up on the pencil and paper. You've got to use a big computer. And you have these computer models. You start with a two-dimensional model where basically uh, the two dimensions, you're basically assuming a perfect sphere for the Earth, etc. And you're not worried about energy flow uh, east-west. You're only worried about energy flow north-south. And so you have uh, not only the flow back and forth from Earth to the Sun, but you have flow in the east-west direction. Uh, again, that gives you uh, better results. Uh, again, you have to break up the two-dimensional space into, into cells and calculate each cell. So each cell, for each cell you calculate how much energy is coming in from all the sides of the cell, how much energy is going out from all the sides of the cell. Now obviously, the actual atmosphere is not divided up into cells. So the, 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 the more cells you use, that is the smaller the cells, the, the closer you're going to be to reality. 
but the more cells you use, the bigger the computer you need. And still, this is only two dimensions, and so the next stage, of course, is three dimensions. And the next stage is don't deal with just the atmosphere. The oceans are important. The ocean currents are important. The different parts of land behave differently. A desert uh, <coughs> it reacts to the sun quite differently than a, a, a forest up in the mountains. Uh, a snowfield reacts very differently than uh, the ocean surface, etc. And so the game is to try and include all of this. By this time, the computers are so darn com complex that even the people who create these computers don't fully understand what's going on. What we're into now is the, the area called complexity. This is a new word in physics and science. Complexity basically means that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Or put it another way, if you know, if you, even if you understand the parts, you have the foggiest notion of what, what's going to come out of the whole thing. You basically have to run the computer and see what happens. Now, uh, that's uh, unsatisfactory, to say the very least. To have a large computer program, uh, you've, you've put together all the little details, but you no longer know what's going to happen. Uh, this is not unusual in, in modern science. Let me put it to you this way, starting with the most devastatingly practical, the design of nuclear weapons. We now have, we now have the ability so we can design and, and, quote, test new nuclear weapons without actually testing them. We run computer programs that tell us whether it's going to work or not. And the fact remains is the governments trust those calculations. And the people, all of the, certainly people who like get weapons, certainly trust those calculations. Same kind of calculations are, do, are done for uh, astronomy. Namely, how do we know what we know about stars? Anybody here know anybody who's been to a star recently? Obviously not. The calculations like this. Uh, so, in any case, how are you going to uh, believe in this? In the final analysis, what you want to do is use this model to predict. And now you're playing with the two philosophically connected terms, prediction and retrodiction. We test by retrodiction, and then if we believe, we predict. We want the models to predict the future. That's what policy is all about. No government is going to shape its policy to change the past. You, cha you shape your policies to, to, to shape the future to your benefit. Uh, and that means that requires prediction. How do you believe in the models that do the prediction? All right, you take the same fancy thing, and you run it backwards, because you presumably know what's going on backwards. <clears throat> so, here's some many models uh, going backwards. I'll give you all three of them, I guess. First one is modeling precipitation, a fancy name for rain and snow. And you're, pre and you're predicting it well, you're, you're retrodicting it over the whole Earth uh, for three months, December to Mer February, uh, February, averaged over longitude. Okay, the thick black curve represents actual observations. The thick black curve represents the actual world as it was for those particular three months. I don't, I don't have the year for that. The various Thinner curves are 15 different climate models. I won't get into why the models are different. Different programmers make different assumptions, etc.